really want to encourage whoever needs to be encouraged at this moment that that you know it's hard enough to go through things when we're together in isolation it can be even more challenging because we're restricted to who we can and can't see and we're restricted to how much interaction we have with one another um in all of that we're never restricted to our time and presence with god So I want to really encourage each and every one of you, if you are struggling, if there's things going on, which I know for some of you there are, just really, really, really want to encourage you to press into God. It's in those moments that we feel as though we've got nothing more, that that's the moment in which it's all of God. Um, And that's, that's speaking from experience of being at the lowest of lows in moments in my life where we're... There is just no energy, no will, no, no willingness to do anything except just, just, just be. And, and coming out of those moments, knowing that in those moments of just being, that's when God held me the closest. That's when God surrounded me the most. That's when people around me were praying more eagerly than ever before. So I want to just encourage each and every one of you with that that, you know, it's in those moments where God is just completely embracing you. Um, and that, that's the hope and the trust that we have in him. So, um, like I said before, you know, we are allowed to give care to one another. If you are struggling and you do need um, someone to talk to, someone to have a coffee with, whatever that might be, just reach out. We have a WhatsApp, which I'm pretty sure most of you are connected to. If you're not, just put a message in and um, Emma will, will get you onto our WhatsApp page. But all you got to do is reach out. And, you know, we've got incredible pastors and we've got incredible leaders that will be more than happy to come and sit with you and just, just share some time with you. We are allowed to give care. <clears throat> we, we've looked into it. it, it it's, we're allowed to do it. So I think that, you know, if it needs to happen, then we need to just reach out to one another and and do that um obviously don't abuse it um that's not what it's there for it's a genuine thing that if you need care we are available um in saying that too 
Um, you know, just keep in mind our, our food support was the busiest it's been <clears throat> in, in nearly one and a half years. We had so many people on Friday, it was uh, the phone wouldn't stop ringing. Um, you know, and we had a, a we had a 17 year old girl come in who who had just been relocated and just found out that she's going to be a mother. No family, no support. And, and you know, the, the hardest thing was in that there was no God either. But, you know, our ladies here, they just loved her, just loved her, embraced her, encouraged her, took her details, um, you know, blessed her, um, filled, filled her carer's boot with, with food and nappies and all sorts of things. But that's what we need to do. You know, that's what we're called to do, that in this time, even though we're not probably doing the best that we could be doing, we're still able to sow into other people's lives. You know, I always think about or something that God's been reminding me about is even though Jesus had been beaten and flogged and humiliated and would have been in the most excruciating pain, in the moments before he gave his life, he turned to his father and said, forgive them. You know, in all of the pain and all of the suffering and everything that he was undergoing, his last words were forgive them. You know, so I want to encourage you guys, if there is unforgiveness or there's anything that's there, you know, surrender it to God. Surrender it to God. Because if he can do that for us, then, you know, that sets an example for what, you know, we need to do towards others. So I just want to encourage you with that. <clears throat> like I said last week, we are God's church. And the scripture tells us that not even the gates of hell themselves will come against what God has planned for each and every one of us. So it's really important that we stay focused on what God wants us to do as a church and where God needs us to be as a church. All right. I'm going to read from Romans, Romans 8. And um, if you've got your Bibles or your phones, or your tablets or your Androids or whatever you use, Romans <laughs> Romans 8, um, what do we got? Uh, Romans 8, verse 31. It says, what can we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for all. Won't God who gave us Christ also give you everything else? Who dares accuse us? whom God has chosen for his own. Will God? No. He's the one who, get, who has given us the right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? Will Christ Jesus? No, for he's the one who died for us and was raised to life for us and is sitting at the place of highest honor next to God, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or are hungry or cold or in danger or threatened with death? Even the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We have been slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ Jesus who loved us. And Paul goes on to say, I am convinced that nothing can separate us from his love. Nothing can separate us from his love. God had a plan for each and every one of us, even from the very beginning when Adam and Eve sinned. And his plan was always his son, Jesus Christ. And we have to know that. And even in those times where we have nothing else, we have to hold on to that. You know, we don't, we don't, I don't have the answer to why things happen. I don't have the answer to why bad things happen. I don't have the answer to why we go through things. All I do know is that as we go through things, what it does is it creates a bigger space for God to come in. You know, and that's what the cross is all about, is that, is that bridge from, from mankind to God to allow him in. And, you know, as we take communion this morning, I want, I want each and every one of us to make sure that we are right in our heart towards each other, towards our, our wives and our husbands, towards our children, towards our brothers and sisters, towards our government, towards all these things that may be uh, oppressing against us. 
I want you to surrender them to God this morning. Sickness, whatever it might be, I want you to surrender them to God this morning as you take communion. There will come a time where there will be no COVID anymore and it will be something that, that's in the past. But there's going to be a whole world in ruins that needs us to rise up. There's going to be a whole world that needs the church to rise up and be that light in the darkness. Now, you might not have much light at the moment, but know that the light of Christ is in you always because nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. And every test that you go through is your testimony. And every mess is, is, is a message to glorify God. So, Father God, just as we take communion, Lord God, I just want to pray a blessing over each and every person, Father God. Lord, regardless of what we're going through, Lord God, that we keep our eyes fixed on you, Jesus, the author and the perfecter, Lord God. Lord, that regardless of the, the attacks or the oppression that we're under, Father God, that we keep our eyes fixed on you, Lord Jesus. Lord, no matter what pain you went through, no matter what you endured, you never forgot what God had called you to do. You never took your eyes off the prize, Lord. So I pray that we keep our eyes fixed on the prize. That is to be the light, to be the church that you have called us to be in our communities, Father God. We pray that in Jesus' name. I don't have to uh, preach, actually, or bring you a message this morning because Pastor Sean did that in the communion message. Um, so it's, it's a lovely thing. And Taylor's first song sort of sums up what we're after as well. Um, but look, I'm just sort of chatting to us this morning as, as brothers and sisters, because that's what we are, isn't it? We're brothers and sisters in Christ. Um, but I've got a little sort of a message thing, and, and we were talking about it earlier. The first word I want to bring to you is the word profane. And Emma looked that up. So profane is the word. I, um, I was brought up in the Catholic system, as you know, and when... The Catholics celebrate, the celebrant, the priest, wears all these magnificent vestments and they're, and they're beautifully embroidered and the colours match the seasons and they sort of work from red to green to all sorts of colours and then Easter is gold and they are really beautiful pieces of work. Great big things that if you put your hands out, they come from the tips of or from your wrists right down to the floor and you wear underneath that a big um, cassocky thing, white, beautiful linen, and, and um, a belt that goes around your, your waist, which has got all beautifully woven and tassels on it. And so it's sacred. It's really sacred. And you start to worship these things. All right. So I'm, I've just come into, into the sacristy, which is where the priests, um, uh, we better put the timer on, hadn't we? Uh, where the priest uh, does his thing and gets all dressed. I've been out lighting the candles because uh, in some celebrations you might have 30 or so candles. So it's a major task to make sure that that happens. And I've come into the, uh, into the sacristy and there's the priest standing there with um, his vestments all sort of pulled up like this and he's digging into his cassock underneath and under this beautiful white linen thing and diving into his pocket to pull out. In those, those days, we used to have hankies. You know what a hanky is? Handkerchief, you blow your nose on it, yeah? So he's dived into his, and, and he's going, <laughs> with all these beautiful sacred vestments on, and he's doing something profane. Yes, you get the contrast there? Something, something that's quite ordinary. Now, blowing your nose is not wrong, eh? but it's a profane activity. It's like uh, when you read your scriptures in the morning and then you go out and wash your car, we sometimes think washing our car is a profane activity, which certainly is different, isn't it? But this message this morning, I hope, will bring together or eliminate the business of our thinking that there is sacred and there is profane. There is stuff that's pleasing to God and directly pleasing to God. And the rest of our lives, the other stuff we do, is not sacred. In fact, that's a myth. And as children of God, it's not the truth at all. As children of God, there is no division between what we do. Everything 
we do can be sacred before God and in fact is sacred before God. It's to, it, it to a degree depends on our attitude, our understanding. Am I making myself clear here? There is no division in any of our lives unless we choose to make that division. The scripture this morning comes from a uh, one Peter. Now, Peter wrote this, these two books, which sit at the end of the Bible, as you know, sort of hidden away there. You don't often go there, but these are two really good books in a circumstance that we're in. We're in, we're under persecution. We're under pressure. And Peter wrote these books to the persecuted church. The church was being, uh, as you know, we won't go into any of that, but the church was under persecution. And Peter gives some very serious, clear advice to anybody who is under persecution. So if you want some advice, grab that book out or those two books out and just uh, work through them. And you'll find he gives very practical advice. And we'll look at some of that advice in a minute. Um, Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 12, my purpose in writing this, this is at the very end of, of uh, the first book. So he says, why I'm writing this to you is to assure you that you are what you that what you are experiencing is truly part of God's grace for you. The person persecution you are going through, the trials you are going through, I'll read that again, are truly part of God's grace for you. Nothing that we are going through now is apart from God's grace for us. There's a little idea I want to just plonk there before you. So the question is, what is God's grace for us? Well, it's our salvation. The great act of God was that we would be saved. So the persecution we're going through now, the trial that you are going through now is a, truly a part of God's grace for you. Whatever you are going through is God's grace for you. Now, if you don't understand, if we don't understand that, we miss completely God's point in our trials now. We can quite easily go through this pandemic having all sorts of very basic ideas about it. For instance, um, we might think, well, I'm just going to grin and bear this because you might be one of those sorts of people, you know. I'm just going to get through this and I've always got through everything and I'm going to damn well get through this now, all right? I'm going to make it happen. Or you might be one of those people who is just sort of a bit phlegmatic, phleg, phlegmatic about it. You think, oh, well, it's all going to pass. Don't worry. Everything will be all right. And you might have that sort of approach to it. I was correcting one of the Cert 4 answers the other day and she said at the outset she was going to eat her way through this <laughs> she was gonna eat her way through it what a beautiful what a beautiful self-awareness hey eh? so that might be a solution that you might have that i'm just going to eat my way through this but that scripture that peter gave us shows us that in fact this thing we're going through now is part of our personal work of our salvation that god has planned for us and if we want to we can work with him through it. Now, Taylor sang that song, uh, Waymaker. Yes. And it says in the song, Waymaker, Miracle Worker, Promise Keeper, Light in the Darkness. This is Jesus. And we've got to find out how that all works in this whole pandemic situation we are in. How does that work in this pandemic? Now, the thing we said, God's grace for us. So we've said our pandemic circumstance is truly part of God's grace for us. Yes, we've said that scripture. And then we said God's grace is our salvation. And we see in, in uh, Romans, no, Philippians, it says we need to work out 
our salvation. So this pandemic thing that we're in is a way of us working out our salvation. Now, we won't go into that too deeply except to say, I'm not saying here that you've got to work at making your salvation work. We understand this, don't we? We're saved once by grace, yes, but we've got to work that out through our lives. Our pandemic circumstance now is a challenge to our faith as to whether we are going to work this out clearly, work this out in fact, and work out our salvation in fact. If you can um, understand a jigsaw puzzle, for instance, you've got all the jigsaw puzzle there, it all sits around for you, but we're just putting the pieces together. And it's not me putting the pieces together. This is very important what I'm saying here. It's not me putting the pieces together. It's God. It's his work. It's him doing it. Even while I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. He's working in our lives continuously. I'll read that scripture again from Philippians. God, we must continue to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act. So it's God working in us. Why the fear and trembling little phrase in there? Because we've got to submit to God's working in us. And if we are not, Submitting to God's working in us during this time will come out at the end a wreck. Now, I don't want to, I don't mean that to be um, ah, threatening or frightening. Or I'm not trying to pressure us into anything. But God promises us that nobody, as Sean, uh, Pastor Sean said, uh, uh, quoted, nothing is going to separate us from God. Rest in that. Nothing is going to take us out of his hands, not even this pandemic. And whatever catastrophe is going on in our lives, and on this screen, there's a fair bit of catastrophe going on in some of our lives. That's never, unless we allow it, but even so, it will never take us out of God's loving care. It'll never take us out. I want to just, I want to introduce the um, spirit, the business of the spirit of the world. We use that phrase, the spirit of the world, and when we use it, we often use it in terms of, you know, you're wanting too many TV sets or you want to have lots of clothes or, you know, those, that, that sort of spirit of the world. But in actual fact, there's a spirit in the world currently that we must avoid absolutely. There's a spirit in the world at the moment that we have to absolutely avoid. And it's not wanting too many TV sets and it's not wanting to go out and party or to do drugs. It's none of that, not currently. If we could, if we could get people to speak here, I'd ask you, what do you reckon the spirit of the world is currently? Well, my opinion is that the spirit of the world currently is fear. Everything about what is happening in the world is causing people to be fearful. And as children of God, as we sit assembled here, we must not have and must not let that spirit seep, seep into us in any way. We cannot allow fear become part of our lives as you look at what's happening in the world um, you'll notice that truth and wisdom and how we're going to live our lives is just being completely taken away from us the whole if you've done any research at all regarding covid and the vaccination process i bet you there isn't anybody here who is not confused there is so much information out there and so much contradictory information that you can't help but come out absolutely confused. So that's just an example of how truth has been 
taken out of the world. And there isn't a single person in this world at the moment who isn't affected by COVID. So something that affects the whole world has no, no truth about it that you can grab and say, oh, yes, that's what it's about. Oh, yes, I should get vaccinated. Oh, yes, I shouldn't get vaccinated. No truth, nothing you can grab, all right? And I'm not making any comments here uh, about any of these circumstances. I'm just saying truth seems to have dissipated. Yes, our lives. For those of you who are worried about Big Brother, well, you've seen Big Brother absolutely infect our lives and government is we're sitting around like this because there's a, been a decision by government to in, interfere with our lives or to have any input into our lives. At this time, conspiracy theories, you know, if you heard about those, haven't you? Food contamination, water contamination, climate change, the e economic situation that we're in now, and will, will we ever re recover from this COVID, um, the effects of COVID on our economy? Education, if you've got your ear to the ground, what's the stuff that they're trying to teach our children? Frightening, frightening stuff. Uh, the international strives, you just watch how the Taliban has just taken over Afghanistan. Frightening. If, you ever, if you've been watching that at all, within a couple of weeks, uh, the, Afghanistan's just been completely taken over. Now that can, all that sort of stuff, can set fear in our hearts. And I'm not trying to do that today. You've heard all of this before. We've all heard it all before. And if you watch the news at all, it's simply a part of the world that we live in. The, Juda the Judeo-Christian base for our society has been ripped out or is dissipating very, very quickly. You know that um, they tried to take the Our Father from, from the House, from parliamentary procedure. We've heard of that. Actually, one of the one of the parliamentarians wrote tweeted that I got more responses to the that thing than I did from the lockdown. So there was a huge groundswell of Christians that said, "No, you must keep this. This is part of our tradition. You must keep the Our Father in our parliamentary procedures." Great stuff, eh? So as Christians, we can make an we can make uh, uh, an influence. So we don't just sort of sit back and oh, say, oh well. This is just going to happen to us. We've got to put up with this. Now, there are things that we can do. But the main thing in this, and what I'm trying to say is, this is a very fearful world that we're living in. It's not me making this up. It's not me trying to make us fearful. It's me stating what the world is like that we are in at the moment. So there's nothing stable in our world. The world that I grew up in, sitting out there in a little country town called Merinol was completely stable. Nothing changed for years and years and years. But that's all changed now. We do live in a very unstable world. So the truth has been taken away, is being taken away. Our lives have been completely changed. And the way we live our lives is being very threatened. Truth way life completely dissipated before us now who said i am the way i am the truth and i am the life who said that we know don't we and he's the one who's our hope here's the one who's our living hope so when things do get haywire we've got one recourse We've got one recourse. That's our Lord. That's our God. That's our Savior. That's our Jesus. Now, you say to me, you might say to me, well, that's very simplistic. You're a dag. Why would you say such stuff? That's just too, too, it's, there's no solution there. There's no, it's not being realistic. I think that's the word I want to use here. You're not being realistic, Tony. Well, the truth of the matter is, the only real is, my God, the only real is our Lord. The only real who is going to be real forever and ever and ever is our God. The kingdom I belong to, the kingdom that we belong to is a stable kingdom. 
that will be forever and will never change. How good is our God? How stable is our God? How wonderful is our God? And he gives me, he gives us life. And this is life, said Jesus, to know the Father and to know me whom he sent. Jesus' words to us, if we get worried about life and how life is, well, it's Jesus we go to. This isn't simplistic. It's simple. And it's so simple, we can miss it. It's so simple, we can miss it. And it's essential for us in order to be able to maintain this here, our stability here. It gives us something to go to, something to hang on to with our minds. When I get, when I get worked up, when I get lost, I don't have to... I don't have to go far at all. Jesus said, the kingdom of God isn't something you can see out there. It's in your hearts. This is Jesus talking to me. So he says, come, come inside, mate. Sit with me, mate. Love me, mate. Because I've loved you. And I've always loved you. And I died for you. This is the one we can rest in. The one we can have. have our, draw our life. It's um, I said as I say, it's a very simple message. It's a very simple message, and we fail often enough to live out of it. We fail often enough to live out of it. When we're panicked, we run to all sorts of things. What are the buffers that we build up and have built up? in our lives what are the buffers well we our, our bank accounts our possessions our family our social connections our jobs they're the buffers and we have to work on all of that don't we i'm not saying ignore all of that but we use them as buffers for security i'll say that again all those things that I mentioned, we use them as buffers to make us feel secure. I've got a sense that amongst a lot of us here, we've had a, a lots of those buffers just removed. And it's a scriptural thing. God will shake and is shaking. And I'm, I've got a bit of a smile on my face, but I'm, I know it's serious. I know it's a serious thing. God's shaking what we are using as our security. And that's an intentional thing to go back to our original scripture because this is God's grace for us, God's grace to me to help me work out my salvation. And my salvation comes from what? My faith in my Jesus. That's where my salvation comes from, my faith in my Lord. And if I've got faith in anything else, that I will be secure in anything else. Then God's going to let that be shaken. He's not unkind. He's not nasty. God is good. And so he offers this as a grace to us. It's part of his grace. With these sorts of thoughts tucked in the back of our minds and growing and where the Holy Spirit can, can water them and plant them and grow our thinking and grow our hearts and grow our minds, with all of these things operating in our hearts, we're growing closer and working out our salvation in a real concrete fashion. Our salvation doesn't stay ethereal. It doesn't stay religious and we don't separate the profane, our worldly life, what we would have called our worldly life, from our spiritual life. Everything is spiritual because God's got it all in hand. We just need to surrender to the process. I want to just finish off with a couple of minutes to just honour the one who brings us stability, like we'd honour our bank accounts by just checking it 
and going and checking it online. We honor our bank accounts. We honor our cars by washing them. I want to just honor our Savior, our Lord. Now, to do this, all I'm going to do is, is read a little bit. Have I done this with us before? It doesn't matter how many times we do it, because I do it as regularly. Colossians. What I want us to do is just sit back. You can close your eyes. You can keep them open. You can do whatever you like. But what I want to do is just read some beautiful stuff about this beautiful guy who died for us and saved us. And I would like you to do what you like, as I say, but just to let this wash across us as we talk about Jesus and ask the Holy Spirit to show you some aspect of it so you can go, ah, that's who you are, Jesus, and I want that to be you and me, a relationship that we have, that feature of you to be a relationship. It's Colossians that I'm reading, 15 to 20. All I'm going to do is, is read it very simply. No bells and whistles. I might make a comment here and there. And as I say, just let it wash across you. This is a, an acknowledgement of who our Jesus is. Colossians. I'd like, actually, you do what you like again, but it'd be good if you didn't read this. Just let it get into your head. Yeah? Don't have any other distractions going on. Christ is supreme. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things we can see and the things we can't see. In case you're distracted already, just let this word wash over you. He made the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all creation together. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He's the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God, in all his fullness, was pleased to live in Christ. And through him, Christ, God reconciled everything to himself. He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by means of Christ's death on the cross. What a beautiful anthem. Hey, what a beautiful anthem. That's Colossians um, 1, I think it is, 15 to, 15 to 20. All I wanted to do is just wrap up with that to say thanks, Jesus, really. Help us to know you. Help us to trust you. Help us to see you for who you are. And thank you for living in us. Thank you that you actually live in us. You who did all of that actually lives in us. Father, we thank you for the grace that you give us. We thank you for our salvation. It gives us such a living hope, a way to live our lives. For all of this, we thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.